Good morning, brethren. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Uh, it's going to be a warm one. I don't know how many people are downstairs, uh, but uh, it's going to be a warm one, but that's fine. It's good to be here together. And I uh, wanted you to stand as I remind you, announcements, grab a chronicle. Lots of new stuff on that. Our call to worship is taken from Psalm 66, verses 1 through 4. Shout joyfully to God all the earth. Sing the glory of His name. Make His praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your works. Because of the greatness of your power, your enemies will give feigned obedience to you. All the earth will worship you and will sing praises to you. They will sing praises to your name. Amen. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word and our time of worship as we join our hearts together. Pray with me. Loving Lord, we are grateful that you have brought us together. We are grateful, Lord, for this local church of Jesus Christ. We're grateful, Lord, for the eternal life you have given us and how you have you have made us, you have birthed us um, to be worshipers of you. And so, Lord, it's during this time that we set aside those things that might distract. And we pray, Lord, that as we come, that we would worship you in spirit, that we would worship you in truth. We thank you, Lord, so much for your patience with us, for forgiveness of sin, for for your grace that just overflows in our lives. Encourage our hearts during this time, we pray in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. And if you're able, uh, remain standing as our music team comes. See you here this morning. Glad the Lord has touched your heart to be here. And we just lift him up this morning and just pray that this could just glorify him this morning. So let's sing.
pray. It is an amazing grace, Lord, immeasurable grace that has rescued, saved, justified, reconciled wretches such as we and even, Lord, as those who have been born again, we still, we still wrestle against the sinful flesh. And we pray, Lord, as we confess our sins for that continued bounty of amazing grace, knowing the promise that we have that the blood of Jesus cleanses us from sin, from all sin. And we confess our willful sin, our sins of omission, our sins of commission, our besetting sins. We confess to you. And our only plea is the cross. Lord, we, we are so grateful that you have called us to be your people. We who once were not a people are now yours. We who walked in darkness have been called into light, and that by your amazing grace. You struck a heavy blow to our pride to our false God of self. Broken, we came to you. Unbelieving, we believed. Unrepentant, we repented. Serving ourselves, we have another master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Continue to grant us that grace to delight in you to delight in the truth of the Word of God, to delight in prayer, even as we come now, your people, having sung praises to your name, and now we pray praise and glory to your name. We pray, Lord, for those within this congregation that are suffering, one way or another, so many battling trials, and we pray, Lord, for them that they would learn to consider it all joy, that you would sustain them and encourage their hearts. We pray, Lord, for those that we know, some, Lord, within this church that are not converted and we pray, Lord, that you would open their eyes to that amazing grace. We pray for revival. Revival in our own midst. Revival in our nation. Even as we pray, Lord, you, you have been merciful to this nation that you have seemingly given over. And yet, Lord, we know that you will build your church, the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Continue to build this local church 
all churches, Lord, that are faithful to your word. We pray, Lord, for our missionary of the week, the Jabellos. We pray for Caleb and Melissa and Papua New Guinea, along with their children, Elijah and Bella. And uh, Lord, would you give them a, a blessed week this week, a blessed month in July. We pray for them as they, as they continue to sow the seeds of a church among these unreached peoples. Give them strength and wisdom and health. And we pray for our sister church in North Ridgeville, Ohio, Cornerstone Bible Fellowship. Lord, we're thankful for them. We pray for Pastor Dunn and pray that you will strengthen him and bless their ministries of biblical counseling, their ministries of preaching and teaching. We pray, Lord, for their upcoming VBS and pray that that goes well, that it's a, a good ministry to the kids and an outreach, Lord, to those that know not Christ. We pray, Lord, for this church member with cancer, and we pray that you might bring healing to the body, strength and encouragement to the soul. And Lord, as we, as we continue this morning, this, this warm but beautiful day, we pray for our brother, Pastor Dave Theobald. We're thankful, Lord, that he was able to join with us by your appointment today to minister the word. And Lord, would you use him and pour out your spirit upon him as he ministers that precious word to our hearts. And so, Lord, we thank you. We praise your name. May this first day of the week just lead to a, a wonderful, a wonderful uh, overflow of blessings in the days to come. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. kids and I have been working on this song, and it's simple but full of truth, and we want to share it with you today. Jesus said that if I thirst, I should come to him. No one else can satisfy, I should come to him. Jesus said if I am weak, I should come to him. No one else can be my strength. I should come to him. For the Lord is good and faithful. He will keep us day and night. We can all strong and kind. Jesus said that if I fear, I should come to him. No
Well, that was a blessing, wasn't it? Day filled with blessings, and we have another blessing, and that is uh, having a friend of mine that I've known for a number, number of years, Dave Theobald, uh, here to uh, share the pulpit and uh, preach from the Word, sharing with us. And uh, I know known Dave, I think, probably through Reed Ferguson, and then going back to the Reformation Society of Western New York, which the leadership of which Dave has picked up from Reed. And uh, so I participate in that group, which is uh, just a tremendous blessing when I'm able to make it anyways. But uh, it's a, a, a very good ministry that Dave has. Uh, Dave has been preaching elder at Grace Baptist in Dansville since 2010. Uh, I didn't realize this, but he's a native of Canada. Uh, earning his Bachelor of Science degree in Biology from the University of Western Ontario. He has an, a Master of Divinity and a Master of Theology, both from Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in Louisville. Uh, for his Master's thesis, I got to read this one, Dave. He, he wrote, Humor and Truth Towards a Christian Theology of Laughter, an Honest Look at the Redemptive Role of Ridicule in the Christian Life. Interesting. We got to got to get a hold of that, uh, Dave, and so I can justify my ridicule of others, I guess. I don't know. But <laughs> while, <laughs> while in Southern Seminary, he had the privilege of serving as research assistant to the president, Dr. Moeller, I presume, and uh, he regularly teaches theology in South America in conjunction with the Seminario Reformando Latino Americano. Pretty good, wasn't that? See, it's the, Itali it's the Italian in me. Uh, Dave is a committed expositor of God's Word who shares a passion with us for the doctrines of grace. In his spare time, he enjoys spending time with his dear wife, Jamie, and their two sons, Job and Jonathan. And so it is my joy to uh, turn over the pulpit at Christ Church to uh, my dear brother, Dave Theobald. Let's give him a Christ Church welcome. <laughs> wow, that was a nice introduction. Um, it is a joy for me to be here today with you at Christ Church, my first time. Actually, I think this is my first time in Clarkson, so uh, don't ridicule me too much about that. It's a beautiful little town and an absolutely gorgeous 
church. I'm sure you, you know that, um, but um, when people see it for the first time, I'm sure uh, it's always the same expression of surprise and delight, and I experienced that walking through these doors this morning. Um, I have long admired your pastor. Um, I'm sharpened every time that I get to interact with him and hang out with him. I'm so glad he's part of our Reformation Society, and I'm very fortunate to be able to call him a friend. I've also long admired your congregation, believe it or not. I'm not just uh, blowing smoke here. I, I mean this from the bottom of my heart. The way that you have cared for the Bartoluccis, really since they've been here, but especially over the last five and a half years, it's, uh, it's really just beautiful. There's so many ways that I could describe it, but in, in short, it's just beautiful. The way that you as a congregation and leadership have cared for your pastor and his wife. Um, so I'm, I'm very thrilled to be with you today. Uh, here, this is part of a pulpit exchange that we have in the Reformation Society. And in my church in Dansville right now is our mutual friend, Ken Beaton. He's uh, preaching the word there. And our mutual friend, Reed Ferguson, is ministering in Bergen at the Bergen Evangelical Presbyterian Church. So uh, it's, it's just great to be able to be connected with all of these faithful brothers in the greater Rochester area. Actually, our range is from Elmira to Clarence and everything in between, uh, connecting around our mutual love for the church and for theology. I'm, I'm glad to be here in conjunction with the Reformation Society. Now, on a day like today, every, everyone looks wonderful. Uh, you've got smiles on your faces. Uh, we've all got a spring in our step, and there's handshakes and there's hugs aplenty. I'm sure you're like this most Sundays, but maybe even more so recently, as we seem to have these COVID restrictions behind us. Uh, it's, it's, it's wonderful to finally see each other's smiling faces and not looking at masks. But I've been around church folks long enough, and I've been a church folk long enough to know that behind the smiles, many of us are hiding a lot of sadness and deep discouragement. And so I hope you don't mind. I know we just met each other, but I, I bypassed all of the light and fluffy topics and decided to speak to you today on the topic of discouragement. And to guide our thoughts, we're going to turn to Psalm 42. I'll ask you to take your Bibles now and turn to Psalm 42. If you don't have your Bible with you, uh, you'll find this passage printed in, on the back of your chronicle. But I'd encourage you to um, keep your Bible open after I read this chapter, because everything that I want to share with you, I want to share from, from the Word. I, I have nothing original. I have nothing wise in and of myself. I want to simply share with you the truths that are found in God's Word. So uh, let's read together Psalm 42, and I'll ask you to stand out of reverence for the reading of the Word of God. You follow along in your copy of God's Word as I read from mine. I'll be reading from the English Standard Version, Psalm 42. This is a psalm to the choir master, a masculine of the sons of Korah. As a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night while they say to me all the day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I would go with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God, with glad shouts and songs of praise, a multitude keeping festival. Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. My soul is cast down within me, therefore I remember you from the land of Jordan and of Hermon, from Mount Mitzar. Deep calls to deep at the roar of your waterfalls. All your breakers and your waves have gone over me. 
By day the Lord commands His steadfast love, and at night His song is with me. A prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with a deadly wound in my bones, my adversaries taunt me while they say to me all the day long, where is your God? Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. This is the word of the Lord. Uh, You may be seated. As we look to God's word, I want to show you three main things about discouragement that emerge from Psalm 42. I trust they'll be of some help. Uh, Number one, uh, I want us to look just generally at the experience of the reality of discouragement. Experiencing the reality of discouragement. And secondly, we'll uh, turn and seek us an explanation as to the root of discouragement And we'll conclude, Lord willing, with some expedience for the relief of discouragement. Again, this outline is on the back of your chronicle, and there's space for you to jot down some notes. First, though, let's consider experiencing the reality of discouragement. As we come to Psalm 42, we find the psalmist deeply discouraged. And I think it'll be helpful if we can try to make some sense of his experience so as to make some sense of ours. Just a, a, a little note, though, right off the bat, and that is that we, we're not certain who wrote this psalm. The superscription, that's the fine print at the top of the psalm, tells us that it is a masculine of the sons of Korah. And the sons of Korah were a, a family of musical priests. But it's hard to say whether they composed this psalm or whether this psalm kind of just became associated with them over time. Many people believe that David must have written this psalm. Uh, Spurgeon would have bet his life on it that that David was the author. But I'm, I'm just not comfortable being more dogmatic than the text itself. So because we don't know exactly who the psalmist is, we can't be sure of the specific situations that gave rise to uh, his discouragement. However, I do think that it's safe to make some generalizations about what this psalmist might have been going through. For example, there's no doubt that the psalmist's enemies are a huge contributing factor to his sadness, to his discouragement. Here they are in verse 3. In his ear, they're mocking him, they're taunting him, saying, where is your God? And whatever his situation is, it appears, uh, to the outsider at least, as if God has abandoned him. And his enemies has seized on that opportunity to, in a sense, kick him while he was down. And not just once or twice, but relentlessly. Do you see? They're mocking him all the day long. Constant taunting. Moreover, it it appears that that taunting has had its desired effect. So look at verse 10. Because by verse 10, the psalmist is feeling this pain from his adversaries. The, The jabs of their mouths are like sword thrusts. By the way, you know those little ditties that you learned as a little kid? You know, the ones about names not hurting and something about you being rubber and the other person being glue. And Basically, those are all lies. They're all lies. The the psalmist might say, uh, sticks and stones may break my bones, but taunts hurt just as badly. Sometimes... Sometimes the taunts are way worse than physical pain. So these taunts from the enemies have inflicted pain, and notice they've inflicted doubt. You can tell that these guys have gotten into the psalmist's head because he asks the Lord in verse 9, why why have you forgotten me? You know, these jerks kind of have a point. Where are you, Lord? 
Another situation that's contributing to discouragement must also have been his isolation and his separation. Again, we're not sure of the specific situation, but it seems as if the psalmist is all alone. If he is separated from the city of God and the people of God, whether this is because he's being pursued and he's kind of running away from his home out of necessity, or whether he's in exile at this point, we we just can't be sure. But this much is certain, he's homesick, and he is fellowship sick. Verse 6 indicates that he's at the northeast borders of Israel, far away from Mount Zion, which is the, the geographical and the spiritual center of Israel. His present location up here in the northeast, Mount Mitzar, it's in the Hermon Mountain Range, and it is a pitiful substitute. That's really the point, because Mitzar in Hebrew means little. So compared to Mount Zion, here he is on this little hill. It's probably not even a mountain. It's probably just a little rolling foothill. It's no substitute to what he loves and where he loves to be and who he loves to be with. He's, for, he's far away from the, the people of God and the public worship of God. In verse 4, he, he shares his fond memories of how he would go with the throng, the multitude in procession to the house of God to keep festival, to worship. And there he was, right front and center. He was the ringleader in all of that worship. But now he's away from all of that and he's all alone. His present experience doesn't compare in the least with his past on almost every metric, whether that's geographically or physically or emotionally or socially, spiritually. All of this, even the fond memories, cannot help but contribute to and to deepen the psalmist's sense of sadness. And you think about the situation that we were in this time last year, having been isolated from our church family for three months, having to worship online. Now, I mean, I was thankful for the technology, but I think we can all agree that it was a pitiful substitute. And if you remember that, then you can, you can get a sense for what the psalmist was dealing with, at least in small part. So those are just a few general situations from the psalm that we could point to as contributing to the discouragement. I have a feeling that the psalmist was intentionally nonspecific about his situation so that we could relate to his experience no matter what the particulars of our situation happened to be. You know, if he he was very specific about what he was struggling with, we would have a much harder time applying it to ourselves unless we were in that identical situation. But uh, when he's generic like that, then we we can enter into that experience and say, yes, I have, I know what he's going through. Verse 7 provides further evidence that he obviously doesn't just have one situation in mind. Rather, his experience of the reality of discouragement is that it seems as if he keeps getting pounded by one situation after another. The picture that he paints is of an angry sea. You know, the breakers frothing and and roaring. Now, my, my wife and I... Uh, are planning to go on a vacation here tomorrow, actually. And uh, and we're going to have some stops along the way. But ultimately, the goal is that it'll just be my wife and I spending a week in Florida, which is, I'm super excited about that for a lot of reasons. But one of them is because I'm a beach guy. I love the ocean. I can stay in the ocean for three, four, five hours at a time without a problem. And I especially love waves. At least, I love the waves that are manageable, okay? Because sometimes they can get really, really intense, and I've, I've been in that situation, and one wave comes pounding um, down on you, and it knocks you back off your feet, and 
just as you're standing to your feet and rubbing the salt out of your eyes, here comes another one pounding you. It, you don't even have time to brace for it. And on and on it continues. You're just getting hammered. And this is how the psalmist describes the experience of discouragement. Except that it's, you know, it's not fun. He's not having a blast out in the ocean. No, situation after situation is crashing down on his head and is knocking him off his feet. And to him, it feels like a conspiracy. You see this expression here in verse 7, deep calls to deep. You know, the scholars aren't sure exactly how to render that, but I think the best explanation it has, is that this is a sort of conspiracy against him. So it's as if, it's as if one wave, deep, is calling out to the wave that's coming behind it, deep. So deep is calling to deep. Okay, hey man, I'm going to pound this guy. And right when he gets up, you pound him, okay? And then tell the deep behind you to pound him. So th that's just so descriptive to me. It's a, such a picture. And so often, this is exactly how discouragement feels, right? Just one thing after another, pounding you, knocking you off your feet. And we use another water expression. We say something like, about a series of discouragements, we say, well, when it rains, it pours. That, that's our experience. And I, I just wonder if you are experiencing the reality of discouragement this morning? Are you, for example, are you discouraged by the direction that our country seems to be going and the lack of principled leadership and character of those in office, both parties? Have, have you lost heart because despite your best efforts at disciplining your kids, it doesn't seem to have any effect whatsoever? In fact, if it's even possible, their behavior seems to be getting worse the harder you try to rein it in. I wonder, is your soul downcast because, well, it seems like every other married couple seems like they have a great relationship, your relationship with your spouse is getting more and more distant every year. It's like you can't even get on the same page about anything anymore. Are you, are you a ministry leader who's been so faithful for so many years, but you're discouraged because no one else is stepping up to the plate? No one else, it seems, has a passion for serving. Are you growing weary in well-doing, as Scripture puts it? And, and by the way, that's just another way of saying, are you just really discouraged? Are you, like me, discouraged with the exceedingly slow rate of your sanctification. Here you are struggling with the same sins and shortcomings that you were 10, 15, 20 years ago. And frankly, you're just sick of it. Why can't I have any kind of victory over this? So, uh, <laughs> how are you doing? M maybe you're thinking, well, I... I wasn't discouraged a few minutes ago, but I am now. <laughs> so, sorry about that. But that's just the reality. In this fallen world, there's all kinds of situations that, that might lead you, that will lead you to experience deep discouragement. Well, there's a whole lot more that can be said about the experience of discouragement as a reality of life in this broken and cursed world, but, but we need to move on. I would only linger for another minute in order to point out that most people, when they're thinking about discouragement and trying to deal with discouragement, don't move on beyond this point, beyond this analysis of their experience. What I, what I mean is that many people seeking relief from the darkness of their discouragement simply try to tinker with the details of their particular situation. You know, if they can just change or avoid uh, the situations that contribute to their discouragement, 
then they suppose that they could avoid or relieve their depression. And, and other people just kind of give free reign to their symptoms and, and their emotions. They, they think and they act as if they are slaves to their emotions that they experience in the midst of depression. And I want to just suggest to you that, that those approaches are just far too superficial. And, and because they're superficial, they're, they're sure to only bring just superficial and temporary relief. You know, it's, it's kind of like how I weed my garden, uh, which I have to do around this time of year. It seems like almost every week. And most of the, maybe this is why I have to do it almost every week, is because usually I just yank those things off at ground level. And it looks good for a few days, but then they're, they're, the stupid things grow right back. And usually, like, bigger and stronger than ever. And I know this. I know that if I really want to make some progress, I need to get right down to the roots of those weeds and root it out. In the same way, if we want to experience some real relief from discouragement, we're going to have to move on from our mere experience. And we're going to have to dig deeper to the, to the roots. Therefore, what I want to do next is turn to, uh, or at least to offer, an explanation of the root of di discouragement. The explanation of the root of discouragement. And the best way to really understand the nature of discouragement, I think, is to work backwards from the cure. You know, typically in medicine or in diagnostics, you work forward to the cure from the symptoms. You know, uh, you, you usually first need to understand the problem before you can offer an appropriate solution. However, sometimes the reverse is true. You know, in, in particular cases that are that are pretty baffling and the doctors don't really know what to say or what's going on, sometimes they learn more from throwing different um, solutions at the thing and to see what's effective. And then from the effectiveness of a particular treatment, that sheds additional light on the nature of the disease. I, do you understand what I'm trying to say? I know that's a little confusing, but we're kind of working backwards here. Let me, let me see if I can give you an example. There's this curious medical condition, or a behavior really, called PICA. Have you heard of this? I learned about this when my older sister uh, developed the habit of chewing ice cubes. And it was, it, you know, we all chew ice cubes from time to time, but hers was like all the time. And, People with pica have been known to eat uh, paper or paint chips or even metal and glass. Pregnant women are sometimes found to consume handfuls of dirt. Have you heard about this? <laughs> okay. Well, incidentally, they say that the, the red clay in my wife's home state of Georgia is particularly delectable. Just. <laughs> but now, what's going on here? Uh, much, much more needs to be studied on, on this, but the early evidence seems to be that what might be happening is that the body is seeking out its own treatment when it develops a craving for this, these sort of non-nutritive items. So the treatment, whether it be ice cubes or paint or metal or soil or fingernails or whatever, the treatment actually sheds light on the nature of the problem. And the problem seems to be that a person's body is lacking some sort of essential vitamin or some, some essential nutrient or element or whatever. And in my sister's case, her ice cube habit pointed to an iron deficiency. And who knows, they, they think that perhaps the bodies of pregnant women are instinctively trying to acquire vitamin B12 from bacteria in clay. 
which has the added benefit of relieving heartburn. That's just the theory. I, I don't want to get into dispensing medical advice here. I, I certainly don't recommend eating soil. Please don't go away from this sermon thinking that. I, I mean, if, if you're struggling with that, if you're pregnant, I would just recommend a prenatal vitamin and some Tums. But I'm simply just trying to illustrate the fact that sometimes we can figure out a problem by first seeing what relieves that problem. So let's see if we can get to the bottom of this condition called discouragement by using a similar approach. In the first place, I'm, I'm particularly interested in the symptom that we encounter at the very beginning of the psalm. Look at verses 1 and 2. It says, as a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Listen, your body knows what it needs, whether it's iron or B12 or, or H2O. Your body knows. And you can only ignore your body's needs so long until it starts screaming at you with an angry thirst. In the same way, the soul of a redeemed sinner knows exactly what it needs. It has been created, it's been recreated to be nourished by God, to be nourished by the living God, the God of life. In discouragement, there, there's a major deficiency that the soul knows instinctively can only be satisfied by coming and appearing before the Lord. You see that in verse 2. So we could ask the psalmist, if he was here, we say, psalmist, what has helped you in your discouragement? In, in the past, what have you ingested to slake your spiritual thirst? And the answer comes back loud and clear. Hope. Hope. Hope is the effective treatment for discouragement. And this much is clear even from the structure of the psalm. Do you see that this is the re repeated refrain? In, look at verse 5. And then verse 11. And then later, the same formula is reprised in Psalm 43. Sort of an encore presentation. In other words, this psalm has a beautiful and musical form that is actually highlighting for us hope as the remedy for discouragement. It reminds me of the kind of uh, structure that we see, for example, in one of my very favorite compositions of all time, that is Handel's Messiah. George Frederick Handel was a, he was a master at what is no, now known as madrigalisms or text painting, which is to say, you know, those, that's the technique of musically depicting what the text is describing. So it's all over the Messiah, if you, if you listen carefully to it. But one of the stri most striking places where you find this text painting is in the third part. Uh, the part that goes, since by man came death. And, uh, well, let me just play it for you, if you don't mind. I hope this is okay, Dan. I'm going to just hold it up to here. Just listen to the, to the structure here, okay? Let's see if this works. Can you hear that
I, sorry for cutting that off, but I, I hope you got a sense for the structure there. Did you hear the, the minor key and all of the dissonance in the verse part when the, when, when the chorus there is singing about death in Adam and sin? I mean, just listening to that is enough to make the zit start popping out of your face. You know, it's so, it's so tense and so dissonant. But then suddenly it switches to allegro and it switches to the major key in order to, to match the glorious theme. And by man came also the resurrection of the dead. And then it switches back to the dissonant minor key to sing more about death and sin, and then switches back to Allegro for even so in Christ shall all be made alive. And what's that doing, that, that pattern? Well, it's highlighting musically the good news. In Psalm 42 and the encore presentation in Psalm 43 have the identical structure. It, it alternates between the dissonant and dismal descriptions of discouragement, and then the bright major key refrain found in verses 5 and 11 and chapter 43, verse 5. And that structure, that repeating structure, I think perfectly frames and highlights the only effective cure for discouragement, which is this, hope in God. Hope in God. Now, when, when you read through the psalm, you can almost feel the psalmist being lifted out of his discouragement at these refrains. Now, of course, we'll want to say more about this cure in a minute, but first, as I said, I'm, I'm interested in working backwards to understand more about the nature of discouragement. So, if hope in God is the effective treatment, then that means that at its root, the root problem in discouragement is some kind of a hope deficiency. A hope deficiency, like a, an iron deficiency. When we're discouraged, we have a hope deficiency. And here's how it works. Hope is the thing that elevates our souls, that gives us buoyancy and vitality. Hope inflates us, so to speak, and, and it enables us to walk with courage and confidence. And when our hopes are dashed or deficient, then we become discouraged. Discouraged, literally, that, to be deprived of our courage. And think about this, if, if you're a visual kind of a learner, think about this spatially. Okay, In discouragement, our hearts sink and our souls become deflated. For example, the psalmist describes his soul as being cast down. Picture one of those tall, uh, inflatable tube, tube guys. You know what I'm talking about that you find at like car dealers or tax preparers? Those, those tube men. And um, they, they have them in front of these businesses to attract customers. And the, that thing gets a shot of air and then the tube man like snaps up and and all tall, all, and you know his arms are akimbo, he's dancing around, and then the air supply gets cut off and he begins to deflate, and he just kind of like falls, but then he gets another shot of air, and just like that it stands up straight, and you're like, ah. You've seen those, right? I'm not just making a fool of myself. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, friends, this is how many of us live our lives. We're inflated by some kind of hope. And then when that hope fails, we just bend over in discouragement. And then something else happens to give us some temporary hope and we're like, ah, oh, yeah. And then it's just bending over again in discouragement. And I believe this is the explanation for the root of discouragement. We get discouraged because we have a missing or malfunctioning or misplaced hope. So let's try some diagnostic exercises. And I'll, I'll volunteer to go first. Why is it when someone criticizes me or my ministry that it messes me up for at least the next three days? 
You know, like I'm, I'm sullen, I'm mopey, I'm dwelling on their comments, I'm replaying the conversation over and over again in my head, except this time I've got like the witty, snappy retorts. Why? Why do I do that? A, a sober analysis leads to the inescapable conclusion that I must have had my hope placed in me, in my own strengths and abilities, or perha perhaps my hope was placed in other people. That the thing that was giving me courage and confidence in life and ministry was the hope that this other person or these other people were approving me and applauding me. And as soon as I discover that that's not the case, that they're not applauding me at all, then, then that hope, that misplaced hope, comes crashing down and it brings my soul down with it. What about you? Are you down and discouraged because it seems like the last three years, it, it's been nothing but trips to the doctors and sickness on top of injury, on top of discouraging diagnosis. Why are you so deflated? Think about it. Do the diagnostic. Why are you so deflated? Well, you say it's, it's the, the situation. It's, it's the cancer, for goodness sake. Wouldn't you be discouraged if you got that diagnosis? And the answer is yes, I'm, I, I probably would be. And I certainly don't want to be glib about whatever difficult situation that you are finding yourself in. But if I understand this psalm correctly, we need to move past the specifics of the situation. We need to get past the symptoms and get right down to the heart of why you're discouraged and why your soul is so deflated. And can I suggest that what we might discover, if we trace it back far enough, is that your soul is deflated because your hope hose is kinked, if I could put it that way. There isn't any hope that's flowing into your soul. And what you need, what I need in these situations, is the kind of hope that kept the Apostle Paul from losing heart. The kind of hope that that renewed and invigorated his inner man even while his outer man was wasting away. Anytime you're feeling like you're drowning in discouragement, to, to switch to another of the psalmist metaphors, anytime that deep is calling to deep and, and the waves of circumstance just keep washing down on your head, every time, as the, one of our favorite hymns goes, when sorrows and sea billows roll, what you need and what I need during those times is a blessed assurance to control. When, when our souls are in turmoil, when we're tossed around like corks on the stormy seas, what we desperately need is hope. We, we need the kind of hope that the author to the Hebrews says is a sure and a steadfast anchor for our souls. The kind of hope that has gone through the curtain and touches the throne. And you might be wondering, well, yes, but is there such a hope? And I'm, well, let's just let the modern hymn writer Stuart Townen answer that for us. Is there a hope? There is a hope that lifts my weary head, a consolation strong against despair, that when the world has plunged me in its deepest pit, I find the Savior there. Through present sufferings, future's fear, he whispers courage in my ear, for I am safe in everlasting arms and he will lead me home. That's, friends, that's the kind of hope that we need. There is that hope to be had. And it's found nowhere else and in no one else but our God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Hope in God. Hope in God. Now very quickly, and you've been very patient, but can I just leave you with a couple of expedients for the relief of discouragement. Expedients for the relief of discouragement. And these all have to do with strategic ways that we can hope in God so as to be lifted out of discouragement. 
And for the sake of time, I'll, I'll just have to be content to just touch on these. And I trust that the Spirit of God will flesh these out in you as you meditate on them and think about putting them into practice. So the first expedient is prayer. And please don't just like turn off your brains right now because that's an obvious Sunday school kind of an answer. This is a real expedient, prayer. And this is what the psalmist does. In his discouragement, you'll notice that he doesn't just gunny sack his feelings. Rather, verse 4, he pours out his soul. Verse 9, he addresses God with all of his questions. And he brings all of his hurts to the Lord. He says, you know, I say to God, I say to God. And friends, what he's describing there is prayer. It's when you say these things to God. And I believe that God welcomes this. (coughs) He desires that. He would draw that out of us. And he would would have us lay those burdens and those cares at his feet. Another song goes, Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Do you, know what, do you know what happens when you begin to pray? Hope begins to flow. <coughs> Look at this in verse 8. He says, a prayer to the God of my life. And you say, sorry, sorry, Psalmist, what did you just say? I said, the God of my life. Oh, he's the, he's the God of my life. Yeah, keep going. Verse 9. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? God, oh, God is my rock. He's my shield. He's my fortress. He's, He's what I can anchor myself to. And do you see that when you pray, if you're praying biblically, you can't help but rehearse all of the kinds of truth that is going to be the basis of your hope. The second expedient for the relief of discouragement is preaching. (coughs) Excuse me. (coughs) And here, I'm not talking about the kind of preaching that you sit under each Sunday from your pastor and elders. I'm not talking about the kind of preaching that you sit under maybe every day from your podcasts or your favorite preachers. Although... The sermons are undoubtedly going to fuel your hope. I'm not even here talking about the kind of preaching that we do Christian to Christian, brother to brother and sister to sister, <coughs> where we admonish each other and encourage with each other in the truth. And that, that also is going to be crucial, but I'm not here talking about those expediences. I'm talking about the kind of preaching that you do to yourself. The sermons that you preach to your own soul. This is what we find the psalmist doing in the repeated refrain. He says, Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? He's preaching to himself. No one has spoken to this particular expedient more effectively than Martin Lloyd-Jones in that classic work of his spiritual depression. So let me just quote him. I won't do it in his uh, British accent, but um, just picture Lloyd-Jones saying this. I suggest that the main trouble in this whole matter of spiritual depression, in a sense, is this. That we allow ourselves to talk to us instead of talking to ourselves. Have you realized that most of your unhappiness unhappiness in life is due to the fact that you are listening to yourself instead of talking to yourself? The main art in the matter of spiritual living is to know how to handle yourself. You have to take yourself in hand. You have to address yourself. You have to preach to yourself. That... That is so good. I like how he puts that. It's so true. 
You know, preaching to yourself involves rebuke. The psalmist is saying to his soul, soul, why are you downcast? And I happen to disagree with a number of commentators that think that this is the psalmist legitimately trying to identify the cause of his discouragement. I happen to believe that this is a rhetorical question, which, as you know, is not really a question at all. It's just a much stronger way of saying, soul, stop it. There's absolutely no reason for you to be discouraged. It's a rebuke. You, do you want some serious relief from your discouragement? Stop listening to yourself and start preaching to yourself. And preaching isn't just rebuking, it's also reminding. So, so pump up your souls full of hope by reminding yourself, for example, of the character of God. And look at this. This, this is written all over this psalm. Look at verse 2. He's a living God. Preach to yourself about who God is. He's a living God. He's not dispassionate and inactive. He's not far off. He is near, and he's alive, and he's active, and his specialty is raising the dead. Verse 2, or sorry, verse 7. Look at verse 7 and learn this about God. He is a sovereign God. He's a sovereign God. These are his waves and his breakers that are crashing down on me. And I know that he brings these things into my life in order to make me holy and to produce steadfast endurance in me. He does that because he's a, he's a loving God. Verse, second half of verse 5. He's a God of salvation. This is who he is. This is your God. He is a saving God. And he's proven it to you by sending his only begotten son to live a perfect life tempted and tried in every way like we are, yet without sin. He is one who can sympathize with us in our weakness. Here is one who knew exactly what it felt like to, to have a soul that was cast down within him and was, quote, exceedingly sorrowful even unto death. Here is one who, who knew by bitter experience what it was like to have his enemies say to him all the day long, where is your God? Here is one who poured out his soul saying to God, his rock, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the answer to that particular question, because that was the only way that sinners like us could be saved. It's the only way for rebels and wretches like ourselves to be reconciled to a holy and just God. In the words of the Apostle Peter, you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers. Not with perishable things such as gold or silver, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in these last times for the sake of you who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and your hope are in God. Brothers and sisters, are you discouraged this morning? Well, then I would say to you, hope in God. For you shall again praise him, your salvation and your God. Amen? Amen. May the Lord richly bless you. Let's just uh, bow in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for your patience with us as we time and time again lose hold on the hope that you have given to us in your word and given to us in Christ. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your condescension. We ask that you would draw near by your Holy Spirit to all those who are hurting here today. I pray that you would remind us um, of your goodness and your grace and your sovereignty. Remind us of Christ. Remind us of all you've done to ransom us and reconcile us to you. 
I ask that you would richly bless uh, this congregation of believers here in Clarkson, that they would be a hope-filled people who reach out to this lost community with the hope that is found in the gospel. Would you bless us all now, Lord, for Jesus' sake, amen. The old British preacher, Joseph Parker, once said, preach to the suffering. There's a broken heart uh, in every pew, and you will never lack for a congregation. I think the same thing could be said for the discouraged. Uh, preach to the discouraged, uh, and you will never lack for a congregation. There's a discouraged heart in every pew, and uh, just appreciate the medicine, the truth that comes out of God's Word that helps us to deal with those things, to deal with those things that, that are common to the, the, the most godly, uh, the most Christ-like struggle with discouragement from time to time. You see it throughout the pages of Scripture, God's choicest saints, Apostle Paul, David, uh, suffered with discouragements, and uh, so do we. But we have... Uh, we have God's Word, and we have the hope of Jesus Christ and resources such as prayer. And I really did appreciate uh, uh, the, the quote from Lloyd-Jones on uh, talking to yourself, uh, preaching to yourself, preaching truth to yourself. Uh, we should not tell lies. Uh, Colossians 3.9, stop telling lies. Don't, don't tell lies to one another. Uh, well, don't tell lies to yourself. Speak truth to yourself. So, uh, Dave, what a joy to have you. We've got to have you back sometime, and I uh, would love to uh, arrange that. Um, let's stand. I don't think there are any other announcements, but we will finish with our benediction. So, sing out with joy, encouragement in your hearts. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above, ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen and amen. Uh, brothers and sisters, I love you. You are dismissed. Greet one another on the way out.